You knew I wasn't gonna leave well enough alone with those check keys I made last time, right? I mean, what channel do you think you're watching? Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Well, the last time we were together, I made a couple of chuck keys, one for the four jaw chuck on my lathe and one for a friend that I'm gonna send over to Quinn at Blondie Hacks. Now, I thought that project was done, but a couple of things have happened since then. The first is that I posted a video about it on the internet and a whole bunch of you left comments telling me what I did wrong and what I should do differently. And in all of those comments, there was one really valuable nugget. Somebody pointed out that the diameter I had chosen for the body of the chuck key was too large and it was gonna strike the chuck jaw when it was backed out, when it was extended beyond the chuck. And I checked and that was absolutely correct. If you extend the jaws out beyond the chuck to hold something large, or if I wanted to back the jaw out completely so I could turn it around, it did indeed hit the key, so that was not gonna work. So we need to uh, turn down the tip of the key to a smaller diameter, we can do that today. The other thing that's happened is I realized that I really do want to engrave these. I want to put a maker's mark on mine and I want to do something fun on Quinn's and we'll get set up and do that today. So I've already got the chuck key mounted in a collet block and this is an ER40 collet block, a square one, and I've got a three quarter inch ER40 collet in there and I just took this over to the vise and cinched it down nice and tight. So I have now uh, something I can use to hang on to this. Now I need as much vertical space as I can get. This is not a large mill and I need to be able to get tools that come in above this because I'm going to engrave on this end surface. So what I've done is I've actually extended the tip of the collet or should be the tip of the wrench down through the bottom of the collet so that it can extend down into the table slot here and get me as much vertical space as I can get. So I can drop that in and the idea is to clamp it here on next to the vise. Uh, I'll just leave the vise on there so that I don't have to take it off and retram it. Use this end of the table, clamp it in place here and I should be able to engrave the end. For engraving this should be plenty rigid enough. So let me get some uh, T-nuts down into the table. Since the tip of the wrench extends into the slot, I have to put that in first. And then got a bunch of pieces from my clamping kit here and I just need to figure out how I'm gonna make this all fit. You want the tail of the clamp slightly higher than the nose just so that you have a good firm clamp at the nose and you're not rocking it on the edge of the part. I'll try to just get this back as far as I can and still clamp on the nut. I don't want to actually clamp onto the collet itself. Okay. Okay, I've got the handle in here just so that I can line it up and I'm leaning over the top and kind of looking down and aligning that with the slots in the table. Uh, it's not critical, it's just aesthetic. So I've got one clamp kind of in place there, just finger tight. And I'll put one over here on the other side, need another T-slot. And to get this one high enough, I've got a one, two, three block to go under the, the little heel block here. Okay, so that's in general. When I bumped it, let me line it up again. And give this a snug. It doesn't need to be crazy tight. It just needs to be nice and firm. Okay, and then the next thing I need to do is I need to find my zero right here in the center. And I believe I'm going to have enough room to get in here with the Heimer. And I'm going to use the Heimer. I could put a dial indicator in here and dial around it, but I'm just gonna to try to find the four sides of the part. And it shouldn't matter because once I've found the uh, uh, the X0, for example, then I should be able to move to X0 and flip around and find the Y. And if I'm really concerned about the X, after I have that zero, I can flip around and find the X again. So. Mm. 
and then we'll recheck X and see how close we were. And that's 436.8, which means if this is 7 eighths, we're, you know, within a thou easily. Okay, I have the model for the chuck jaw here in Fusion 360, and you can see I've added a turn down section on the end to clear the chuck jaw. This is the one for my uh, six inch chuck. This is the one for Quinn's five inch chuck. It's turned down a little shorter distance to a little smaller diameter. Let's start with the one for mine. And let's come down here on the end and create a sketch. Right click, create sketch. Now we want to put text on a circle. I'd like to put the text around the outside. So I'll hit C for circle, X for construction, and just pull out a circle here. Click and I'll hit D for dimension. And we'll put a dimension on that. Uh, 450,000, eh, close enough, I don't know, we can come back and adjust that later. So I go up here to create and say text, and we have a choice, text or text on path. I'm gonna choose text on path, and I'm gonna select that circle as the path, and I'll put in my sample text. Cloud 42, uh, 2021. 20, now let's pick a font. Let me make this a little bit smaller first. So the height here is 394, that's too big. Say 150, that's still too big, 120. Let's pick a font and see how that works out. So if we look down here, these are all the fonts that are installed on my system. But up here on the top, there are a bunch of these SHX fonts and these are like stick fonts. So I'll pick one, uh, cause I just wanna do single line engraving. So that looks good to me. And then I'm gonna come back in here and put some spaces in to sort of try to space the text out and get it sort of centered. And that looks, okay to me. I think I'm going to maybe go just a little bit smaller. Yeah, 110. And then I'm going to make this circle a little bit bigger. Whoops. I lost my text. Let's do that again. Create text. Text on path on this path. And then we'll just sort of put some spaces in to get it aligned about where we want it. Okay, that looks good. I do want to make this a little bit bigger. 0.48 maybe. Yeah, that puts it more where I want it. And then I'll double click on the text again and put in my spaces again to try to get that kind of centered up where I want it. Yeah, that looks okay. So there's my, there's my text. Now this text is currently a font. I actually want to explode it so that I will have paths for, um, for engraving. So I'll right click, you know, touch it someplace so it's highlighted, right click and say explode text. And now it has turned green, but now I have text on there. And unfortunately that is still marked. Let me hit control Z to undo that. I had construction lines turned on, turn that off and do that again, explode text. There we go. Now I've got, you can see green lines here, and I've actually, these are actually sketch lines that can be used later for engraving. Great, so we've got that one done. Let's switch over to this other one for Quinn. Now in this one, I wanna do a little, something a little bit different. I'd like to put a nice big stylized Q on here. I think that would look cool, kind of monogram the end of it. So let's do the same thing, create sketch. We'll dispense with the circle this time and just go to text and click to place it and we'll just put a Q. And we gotta pick a font. And I played around a little bit and I think I'm gonna use a Baskerville Old Face. And then of course we need this to be bigger. How much bigger? Well, that's actually just about right. I would like that to be bold. Double click it, bold. We kind of move this around. Now it looks a little bit fuzzy right now, but we can do exactly the same thing. Right click on this and say, explode text. And now we have lines on here in the form of a nice uh, elegant Q. Now I am noticing one thing here that's a little bit funny, and I think this is an artifact of the bold you can see that the lines actually sort of crossed over each other and we've got this little shape. So I need to clean that up. So I'll go up here to modify, choose trim, 
and then I can come in here and click the line segments that I want to remove and it'll remove it back to that point. And I can see that we've got something very similar happening right here. So I'll do exactly the same thing there. And there we go. Now we've got lines in a sketch in the form of a queue. So the next step would be to go into the manufacturer workspace and generate some G code to actually go and engrave this. Okay, let's open up the manufacturer workspace and we're going to create a new setup. So I'll say setup, new setup, and we have to define a few things. First thing I wanna define is the model. This is the thing that we're gonna be engraving. And I will select that. And then let's go over and set up our stock. And instead of trying to define a box or a cylinder by dimensions, I'll just say from solid and I'll select the model because that is what we're actually going to be engraving. And then I am gonna define a fixture in here and I'm just gonna select the handle and the screw just so that it knows that those are things that it should not cut into. And if we accidentally generate a toolpath that intersects them, we'll get a warning. And then we need to set up the origin here. So I will click on the origin and then click on the center point of the top here. And it looks like Z is going the wrong direction. So I'll click the body of the Z axis arrow and click this top surface. And now what that's done is it's moved this back down here. Click that again, click our top point to move it back up. Stock, let me fix this stock. I want to say model box point. So now I can click that and click here. And uh, we need to get our orientation right. X is going the wrong way. Click the head of the arrow. Now that goes to the right. Z is up. Y is away from us. X is to the right. That is correct. And now we should be ready to set up our tool paths. But before we can create a tool path, we need a tool. This is the tool that I'm gonna use. This is a Lakeshore Carbide 20 degree per side tapered engraver with a 20 thousandths ball tip. Now, if I don't have a definition for this tool, I need to create one. So I'll go in here into my tool library. Now I've already created one, but let's take a look at what I had to do to do that. So double click to open it. And I've gone ahead and entered a description for this thing. It's a 20 degree engraver. And I put in the Lakeshore Carbide product ID and a link to the page so that later if I pull this program out and I'm not sure what tool it is, I've got all the information, I can order another one. Let's go into cutter. Now there's a bunch of ways that you can model this. And I see now that there's an engraved chamfer mill in here. I didn't use that. I actually used the tapered mill as the tool type to set this up. So units is inches because that's what this is. Clockwise, two flutes, carbide, and the tapered type is bullnose because it's got a rounded quarter. In fact, it's all corner, it's a rounded ball end. So the important things here is I set up the diameter of a quarter of an inch, overall length and the length below the holder are set to three inches and one inches. And um, I set up the taper angle as 20 degrees, which is, is 20 degrees per side and a corner radius of 10 thousandths of an inch because the end is supposed to be a 20 thousandths ball. So I set the corner radius to 10 thousandths and the diameter on the end as 20 thousandths. So that's the diameter of the tip. This is the corner radius. So that will actually define a ball. Then we need to know what the shoulder and flute length is. If you look over here at the picture of the tool, we've got our ball point and then it comes up and meets that quarter inch. Well, how long should that be? Well, the easiest way to figure that out is just with constructive geometry. So I'll just open up a new design here. I'll create a sketch. doesn't matter where I create that. I will just click look at, and let's just create a sketch of this thing. So let's start with a circle, C for circle, pull this out, D for dimension, and I'll say 0 0.020 because this will be the ball tip of the tool. Now let me create a construction line here. L for line, X for construction, and we'll just put this up here and make a dotted, whoops, did that wrong. L for line, there we go, X for construction, and pull up a construction line that's vertical. Now I'll hit L again for line, and I'm gonna hit X again to toggle off construction, and I'm gonna pull a tangent line off of the side of this. Now you can see, depending on what angle, when I reach exactly that angle, the tangent constraint appears. And if I pull away from that, it's not there. So I'll take advantage of that, 
pull this out until I see that constraint and place my line. Now I want to mirror that on the other side. So I will select this to mirror, mirror line here. Okay, so now those are mirrored. So whatever happens, they're both stuck tangent. And I will create another line that goes across the top. Now ultimately I'm trying to figure out the distance from the point down here. So I will create a point just so I have something to dimension off of that is on that circle. And I'll click that and hold, I'm holding control so I can click both the center of the circle and that point. And I'll come up here and click the horizontal vertical constraint so that will line up. And so then I will put a dimension on the top here. I want to come up to 0.250 which is the diameter of the tool. Let me zoom out here so you can see this whole thing. I will hit D for dimension, put a dimension between these two. We know this is gonna be a 40 degree included angle because it's 20 degrees per side. So now we have all of our dimensions and the distance between that point and the top of this is the length of the flutes. So I'll just hit D for dimension, select that, select this, pull it over, and it's going to say this will over constrain, choose OK to create a driven dimension, which means we're not going to provide the value. It's going to tell us what it is. And there it is, 324 thousandths. So if I go back over here and edit my tool, there's that value, 324 thousandths, that got me this tool geometry. So we have the tool already defined. Let's go ahead and create the tool path. So I have my setup here. I'm gonna go under 2D, trace, and then I'm gonna select the geometry that I wanna trace with the tool. So it's those three closed paths. The tool, I will just select this tool that I already entered. And let's see, default spindle speed is 12,000 RPM. This is all predefined. I wanna go 1,000 per revolution, which is about 24 inches a minute. That should be fine. We've got the geometry. Now let's take a look at our passes. So the axial offset right now is zero, which means that it will trace right at the surface of the material. I would like to actually go 5,000 deep, 0 0.005. Actually, I want minus 0 0.005. And that should be all I have to do. And that will give us a tool path. Let's simulate this, make sure we're getting what we want. I'm actually gonna turn off the model over here and simulate, it shows stock, and let's hit play. Whoop, that was super fast. Let's just walk through this by hand and see what it's doing. So it's coming down. And engraving the lines, that actually looks like exactly what I want. And the finished result looks like about what I'm looking for. So we are gonna call that good, and let's post it. Post process, I wanna choose Mach 3 mil, which is already here. And we have our G code. And this is all ready to take out to the mill, just as a sanity check. The only tool in here is tool 31, and the Z minimum is minus 5,000, which is exactly what I want. It shouldn't go any deeper than 5,000 below the surface. That one is ready to go. Now we just need to go over here to the one for, for my chuck and select all these lines and do exactly the same thing and generate the G-code. And then we are ready to go out to the mill and do some engraving. Okay, I've got the engraving tool here all set up in a tool holder. Okay, I think we're all set to go. This will be the first time I've used this particular carbide tool in steel. Hopefully everything is rigid enough and uh, we're not gonna end up with any problems. Should be engraving five thou deep. Let's give it a shot.
Okay, I'm pleased with that. It's only five thou deep, but it's nice and clear and clean. Let me uh, get this one out. Let's set up the other one for a Quinn and let's see engrave it too. But first, I'm gonna get this tool out of the way so I don't put it through the back of my hand. Okay, I've got the other part in here and uh, the handle I didn't have the screw in, so I just went and took it out so it wouldn't rattle around. And I've zeroed up on this. This is the one for Quinn, and so we are ready to engrave. Okay, that's not nearly deep enough, so I'm going to go repost the program and take a few more thou. Actually, I'm just going to adjust it and I'm just going to zero it a little bit deeper. We'll make this work. Okay, that gave me something I'm real happy with. I will uh, go spin this in the lathe a little squat scotch bright and clean it up. And I'll meet you over at the bench. And here are the finished parts. Now, the body diameter that I chose for this chuck key, I got a bunch of questions in the comments about why make them so big. And the reason is because I wanted to start with a handle that was a half inch diameter so that it would fit my hands well and so that I could get good, easy torque manipulating the chuck. And so having the half inch diameter here led to a uh, seven eighths and three quarters inch diameter for the body. And I just ran that full length in order to uh, try to make it consistent and make it look aesthetically pleasing. Now, as was pointed out by more than one person down in the comments, this large uh, shaft does not actually clear the jaw on my chuck when it's fully extended. And so I came back and turned this down. I didn't get that on camera. It looked exactly the same as when I turned this down. And when I put the original taper on the end, I just did exactly the same process and put a narrowed end on the shank so that it would clear the chuck jaw when the jaw is fully extended. And the chuck that Quinn has actually has an even narrower uh, chuck key and even less clearance around the jaw, so I had to turn it down to an even smaller diameter. I'm not super happy with this aesthetically, but it's going to be functional and it's going to work. Another question that I got was, why didn't you heat treat these? Now, the stock chuck keys that came with uh, my chuck and with the one for Quinn's lathe uh, are just dead soft like in the mid 20s uh, Rockwell C. So they're just, they're not heat treated at all. And we talked about it and decided that we'd probably be better off just keeping the new chuck key soft as well. So that if anything wears out, it'll be the key and not the drive in the chuck. Figured that would be the way to go. And if it does wear over time, there's plenty of material here to cut it back, put a new square drive on it, could always heat treat it at that time. So I'm very pleased with how the engraving came out. That cue on the end is just gorgeous. I'm, I'm very pleased with that. I like it, it's subtle and it's elegant and I just, uh, I like how that came out. Uh, this one, the one for me, I just marked with my name, Cloud42 and the date 2021. And you know, I'm happy with that. It's nice and clean, but mm -hmm. I, I kind of like the monogram look. Anyway, I think these are now finally done. By the way, in the last video when I pointed out that I was gonna leave the center in the end in case I needed to rework them, well, I needed to rework them and having that center already in the end made it really easy to do. So I think though that these are finally done 
And I think that's all we're gonna have for today. Pay no attention to what you see in the background here. That's a future video. Uh, but in the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.